go ahead and get started. Um, I forgot to do my literary, literary analysis at the end of the last video, so now I have to do it now. Um, there's this poem by Robert Frost, which I always think about in context of non-determinism, called The Road Not Taken. Have you guys read this in high school English? Everyone remembers this poem. Um, I love poetry because it's short and you don't have to do too many pages of reading. Uh, two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other just as fair, and perhaps, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black, Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So the context of the poem is Robert Frost, unfortunately, has to make a decision. Or whoever the story is, you gotta, there's a road, and then there's a fork in the road, and then there's Robert Frost, or whoever... Yeah. And he comes to the fork in the road, and then he has to make a decision, so he's not happy anymore. And one of them is really scary and has, like, lightning on it, and the other one has, it's really pleasant, and then it's got trees. Um, and he talks about, you know, how I'm coming to the fork in the road, and I'm sort of forced to make a decision between the two. But really, uh, my reading of the poem is that Robert Frost is a deterministic actor. He is forced to come to the road, and he is forced to make a decision. Um, he has to choose one or the other, and this is evident by the things. He, couldn't, he can't travel both, be one traveler, uh, and he has to take one less traveled by. But if we consider a non-deterministic Robert Frost, he comes to the fork in the road, which path does he take? He comes to the fork in the road and he simply takes the fork. So he takes both of them. Um, and that would be, the better, uh, I think, a better version of the road not taken by Robert Frost, just taking uh, if he was non-deterministic. Okay, so that was, the, was, that was supposed to be the end of the last video. Now we have to get to the beginning of this video. Um, this button? This button? Okay. Uh, this is L02B. Uh, the title is on what's called the power set construction. The power set construction is kind of a spoiler of what the topic of today is. We're really going to compare and contrast NFAs and DFAs with each other, because that's really what we want to do, is measure the relative power of these things. You know, we are trying to formalize the definition of a computation. We're trying to make a good model of a computer. And we remarked that the DFA was weak. We didn't prove it yet, but we kind of made this remark that it's, it's, it's inferior of a device. Um, so let's contrast how much stronger, if at all, did we make the NFA. So recall uh, LDFA is the class of languages decidable by a DFA. If L is in LDFA, if there, are, if there is a language in LDFA, you know it's regular. A regular language is one that has a DFA for it. So these are the class of languages decidable by DFAs. We also defined, uh, we can also define this, the class of languages decidable by an NFA. Right? So if a language is in LDFA, it has a DFA for it. If a language is in LNFA, it has an NFA for it. Right? Using set theory, we can compare and contrast these, these two classes to compare and contrast the power of DFAs for themselves. What do we know, uh, what do we think we know about the relationship between these two? DFA is probably a subset of NFA. Why? Uh, NFA looks like, it is everything the DFA can do but more. The DFA, you could say, by the generalization of non-determinism, Every DFA is an NFA that doesn't do anything non-deterministic, right? Superman, if you forget the kryptonite part, ignore the kryptonite part. Superman, everything a normal human can do, Superman can do, if you forget the kryptonite part, right? He can do everything. He can check out books in the library. He can mow his lawn. Superman can still do all those things. The power doesn't come at the cost of doing stuff if you ignore the kryptonite part. He just can do, uh, he's a superset of all the powers, right? Um, let's prove it a little formally just to give you a taste of what proofs like an automata. We prove... Uh, LDFA is a subset of LNFA. Uh, let uh, L be an element of LDFA. Uh, now, we wouldn't really, in practice, need to prove this, but I just wanted to do it out loud. Uh, it's sort of trivial, right? If L is an LDFA, we know it's regular. So uh, there exists a DFA 
a D to decide L. This uh, DFA is also an NFA. Define NFA N identical to D. This is an NFA to decide L. So, since L has an NFA to decide it, L is an element of L NFA. Since this is for any L in uh, LDFA, uh, then we can see that LDFA, every element of LDFA, must be an element of LNFA, UED. Now, did we need to do all of that? Did we need to do any of that? No. But it's just sort of a structure of what the problems, what the proofs look like. You know, Take one element of one, show it's in the other, therefore it's a subset. Right? That's how proofs work. Uh, questions on this through the arguments here? We made a new NFA N that was just basically the same as the DFA, and then it's in it, right? Question on this? Now, what do we think the relationship is between L and NFA? So we, first off, we, the subset is important, because we know it doesn't look like this, OK? Something weird. We know there's not like some non-trivial weird overlap. We know that there's two cases. The two cases are, this can't happen. The two cases are, one is a strict superset of the other, like an avocado, or that they're equal. So we can prove they're equal or not equal if we can find one language decidable by NFAs, which can, does not have a DFA to decide it. Right? So here's the question. Is this strict? NFAs have all this power. Can we find an element? Does there exist an L, which is an element of L uh, NFA, and then not an element of LDFA? Anyone have any conjectures? This is equivalent to P equals NP. And I would say most people say P not equals NP. Well, we can't prove P not equals NP. That's so true. I wouldn't talk about it in class if we couldn't prove it. All right, lecture one, let's prove P does not equal NP, right? Um, it's interesting that you remark that because the P versus NP problem is, in fact, a generalization of this problem. And the surprise we can't solve the P versus NP problem comes from many places. One of them is because we can solve this problem. Other conjectures about can we say, can we say NFAs have measurable power? Perhaps not with respect to efficiency. We did say that some NFAs take more states, some DFAs take more states, but with possibility. Any conjectures? do manually when we evaluate, like we're deterministic, and if we can evaluate an NFA, then in a lot more work, we must be able to evaluate an NFA doing deterministic work. But like, we also have memory, which DFAs don't have, so maybe that throws it off a little bit. Yeah, so you're defining that there does exist an algorithm for NFA. So certainly there exists an algorithm for, a deterministic algorithm for NFAs, BFS or whatever. But to argue there's a DFA for it, you need to argue there's a restricted kind of algorithm. And it turns out there is. In fact, these two are equal. The answer to the, both these questions is no. They're equal. Which should surprise you, one, because NFAs are weird. They have all this complicated stuff, all, this, all these three powers. But we can actually just do all those powers with deterministic counterparts. We can simulate the non-determinism all deterministically, but with cost. So it turns out that they're equal. It may take us some more states to do the same thing the NFA can do quickly, but it turns out we can do it all the same. Which should surprise you because NFAs are really weird. Um, how are we going to prove this? We already proved that every DFA is, is an NFA. We're going to do the reverse implication, prove that every NFA has an equivalent DFA. Not that every NFA is a DFA. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that every language that has an NFA has a different DFA to decide the same language. 
right? We prove this way, we prove this way, double set containments are equal, right? Any questions on the premise of what we're doing? We're going to prove it right in a second. Uh, here's how the algorithm works. Uh, 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 here's how the DFA works. An NFA can be in multiple states at the same time, right? That's the trick. It can be in multiple states when it's performing the computation, right? We say it's in both when we take two A transitions out, right? But uh, right. Um, how many states does a DFA have? Finitely many. It's a constant number of states, right? It's the size of the input. So, uh, how many subsets? How many possible subsets of states could an, a, a, could a uh, DF, uh, NFA be in at once? How many subsets of a finite set are there? A finite amount. Yeah. So like 2 to the finite is finite. So what we're going to do is make one state per subset of states, and then just define our transition function accordingly. If we have something like this, if you're at 0 and you non-deterministically choose between 1 and 2, what you're going to do in the DFA is go between 0 and a state representing 1 and 2 simultaneously. That's all that's going to happen. That's all it does. This deterministic. You pretend, pretend you're like a swarm going through the, DFA, through the NFA. Several states, you evolve to a new subset of states, to a new subset of states. But you can just choose, make a state for each possible subset, and then go between one state at a time, deterministically. That's all the proof of the, subs, of the power set construction is. Um, we're going to define rigorously how to do this construction, how to do the NFA. Uh, excuse me, how to do the DFA. Given an NFA, we'll give a process to convert it to a different looking DFA. It will have exponential blow up in the number of states because we need one state per subset. So it'll be exponentially many states. But it's fine. I mean, that's okay. That's still finitely many. <coughs> Questions on the, on, the, on the premise or where we are? Um, two quick comments. One, this proof earned Rabbit and Scott a Turing Award this paper was published in like 1958, 59, and it earned them a Turing Award in like 1973, something like this. So just to see how far computer science has come, uh, something you could have done in a paper in 1959, which would have accepted, which would have accepted award, an award in 1972, can now be taught in the first week of a summer course for undergrads. So this back then would have earned you a Turing Award. Uh, unfortunately, you guys were all born after 9-11, so you won't get the Turing Award uh, for doing things as easy. Um, the Turing Award also is given for many diverse things. And uh, last year, they gave it to a guy who invented Ethernet. Uh, this year, they gave it to Avi Wigderson. Avi Wigderson is a complexity theorist. We won't get to talk about his work, but he, his name pops up all the time with the P versus NP problem. So kind of interesting that this, this, this is a proof that earned a Turing Award. I think that's kind of a fun fact. So let's just get on to the construction. Oop. So we'll give the formal definition, and then we'll give the uh, an, we'll do an example. Right. So first, we need to handle these epsilon transitions, which are kind of annoying. So we'll define something uh, a function called reach. Reach of a state is going to be equal to a set of states. It's going to be equal to q i and all states reachable from qi by epsilon transitions, right? So we want to just define if you're at qi, you're also simultaneously at any state that can be reached from qi through epsilon transitions. So for example, let's say you had qi, let's say q1. Q2, uh, Q3, Q4, right? Something like this. Uh, reach of Q1 would be what? All of them? No. No, sorry. <laughs> it's definitely, it's not all of them this time. Yeah. I threw in Q4 this time to just, just to gotcha. Right. 
right? It's Q1 and anything reachable from Q1 by epsilon transitions. So you can reach Q2 by epsilon transitions. And you can also reach Q3 by epsilon transitions from Q1, right? So that's just how we're going to get around epsilon transitions, right? Um, so now we're going to just, we're simply going to define, uh, uh, given an NFA, we'll talk about how to create a DFA. So let's suppose we're given, uh, suppose we have NFA. Now, of course, we talk about state diagrams. Everything is nice, but we have to go with the formal definition. And NFA has several parts, right? It has Q, sigma, uh, we'll say, we'll say um, NFA n. It's going to be Q, sigma, Q0, uh, delta, and f. We give uh, DFA. Uh, D, uh, such that they decide the same language. Uh, L of D is equal to L of N. So they aren't identical programs, like symbol for symbol, but they have exactly the same behavior. They decide the same language. They reject all the same strings and uh, accept all the same strings, right? So what should Q be? Uh, we'll, say the N, we'll say the D, we'll say D is going to be equal to Q prime, <laughs> sigma prime, Q0 prime, delta prime, and F prime, right? Um, I'll just move over. What should Q0 be? Q prime be? Power set of Q. Power set of Q. We want one state of Q prime to be for every possible subset of states, including the empty set, including none of the states, for uh, those in Q. Right. <coughs> then we want uh, sigma prime. What should sigma prime be? Trick question. Wait, for, for Q prime, do we also need, like, because we're allowing implicit rejection, do we also need, like, an extra? That, ends, that trash can state ends up being the empty state. Ah, okay. The empty, the empty you, you'll see in the construction. Right. If, each, if, if being in a state represents being in, being in one state of the DFA represents being in multiple states simultaneously, being in the empty set state represents it being none of the states simultaneously. It's our single implicit trash can state. Uh, what should sigma prime be? Sigma? Yeah. The trick question was that I said it was a trick question. Um, Q0 prime should be what? This one's actually a trick question. The reach of Q0? Yes. It's not simply Q0. It's everything that can be reachable from Q0. Because recall, if you have epsilon transitions coming out of your start state, you can, go to, you can start from somewhere else. So you just want to say anywhere else I could have started from. right? Um, we can also, then we can do, here's the hard part. How are we going to define our transition function? Uh, so like, let, let s be any subset of states of Q, or that s is an element of Q prime. So s is a subset of states of Q. Therefore, it is a. Uh, Uh, if S is a subset of states of Q, it's an element of Q prime, because Q prime is the power set, right? Um, how should we define delta, there we go, delta prime of S comma A for any A in sigma prime? The union of delta applied for all, like little s belonging to S. Right. Reach of that. Belonging. It's going to be anything that you could have reached. So it's like for any Q that was in S, it's going to be, uh, the reach of delta Q comma A. Do we understand this notation? I'm unioning over all the elements that are in the subset S. S is simultaneously a subset of the NFA and a single state of the DFA. The transition is going to be defined to one state, this union, going to be defined to the one state, which is a set of states of the DFA, but one, of the NFA, but one state of the DFA. Right? The union will return a set of states, which is one state, because it's the DFA. Right? Questions on this one? Everything, always the transition function is the most important thing. All the other stuff is just whatever. But the transition function does all the work for us. So it's important that we understand this is to be true. Reach is, of course, it does, it does its own heavy lifting. That's there because anything that was reachable from those states, we want to reach them as well. So it doesn't matter where we take the 
epsilon transitions or not, right? If you had something like this, it would still work. Right? If you take A or epsilon, it's, those are still reached. It's still, you still get to both states at the end, right? Um, so this would be identically. Let's say this is 0, 1, 2. It, this function would still just return like that, right? Uh, final states. What are the final states? This is not a trick question, but it is slightly difficult. Without math notation, with using human language, what should the final states be for the simulation to be correct? Any set of final sets from the NFA that has a single accepting state? Correct. If, if Q2 was an accept state, you want any state of the DFA that contains Q2. Because the DFA accepts if there exists an accepting computation path. How do you define that mathematically? Well, here's what I have. I'm sure you could do something similar. I have S is a subset of Q such that S intersect F of the, of the original NFA is not empty. That's my uh, mathematical notation for that one. Um, but it will, of course, make sense when we do the example. Now, questions on the formal definition. We have all five parts of the, of the NFA. We'll, of, of the DFA defined, the, this DFA is correct simulation of an NFA. Right. We gave, last time, we gave a DFA to simulate two DFAs at once with quadratic cost. And you have to pro Cartesian product the number of states. Here, there's an exponential blow up in the number of states, but this is a deterministic simulation of a non-deterministic object. The non-deterministic object is simulated at cost. There's an exponential blow up, but it still is correctly simulated. Right. Questions on this one? All right, let's do an example. So let's do uh, L2, uh, W is in sigma star, uh, W uh, begins or ends, let's do ends with uh, AA, right? The NFA for this one was pretty simple, Q0, guess your prefix, and then you just go AA. Right? That was our uh, NFA, right? So how do we begin? Let's make our states. We need, now instead of using Q, I'm just going to use the number to make things simpler. So I have the following states, 0, uh, 0, 1, uh, 0, 1, 2. I have 1, 2, uh, 1, 2. Uh, let's do 0, 2 here, and let's do the empty set state here, right? The empty set state, is, by our definition, is going to end up being the implicit rejection, right? So these are our eight states, already a lot more than the three, but 2 to the 8 is 3. 2 to the 3 is 8. Uh, what's our start state? I'm only doing a small example because there's an exponential blow up, and I also didn't want to do any too, too many complicated epsilon transitions, right? Now, let's say there is uh, a A. If we're in this state and we see an A, if we're in the NFA and we see an A, where do we go? Zero, one. We go to 0 or we can go to 1. So in our DFA, we're going to go to 0, 1. And now if we're in state 0 and we see a B, what do we do? In the NFA, we see a B, we go either to implicitly reject, or we can stay in B. So it's just, it's, we stay in Q0. So it's just Q0, right? Follow along with the transitions. Hopefully, we'll get them all done. 
if we're in state 1 and we see an A, where do we go? Q2, right? If we're in state 1 and we see a B, where do we go? We implicitly reject. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the trash can state. If we're in state 2 and we see a B, if we see an A, where do we go? We implicitly reject. It's for both A and B, right? Let's do the trash can state now. The trash can state is if you're in that set of states at once, that's where you go. If you are in no states simultaneously and you see an A, where do you go? What? Stay there. You go nowhere still. Yeah. None of the states, you can, there, you're not at a state with a defined transition because you're at none of the states. Vacuously, you stay. OK. Let's suppose. Your, those are the easy ones. Suppose you're in 0, 1 simultaneously. What that means is you're both non-deterministically in state 0 and in state 1. And you see an A, where do you go? You union wherever you would go if you were in state 0 and in state 1. So what state is that? If you're in state 0 and you see an A, you go to 0, 1, right? If you're in state B, 1 and you see an A, you go, to, you go to 2. So you go to 0, 1, union 2, which is 0, 1, 2. Now, let's say you're in 0, 1, and you see a B. You implicitly reject here, so it's going to be the empty set. And then you go to Q0 here. So empty set union Q0 is just Q0. Now, let's say you're in uh, 0, 2. So you're in the first and last state simultaneously. And you see an A. Implicitly reject. Stay in Q0. So you're here, and you see an A. No, that's not correct. If, you, if you're in uh, 0 and 2 and you see an A, you can implicitly reject from here. Or you can go to Q0, Q1. So that has you. Zero one, right? Oh, I'm doing 0. I'm, I'm saying do 0. Yeah, my bad. I'm doing 0, 1, 2, but I'm thinking 0, 2. If you're in 0, 1, and 2 simultaneously, and you see an A, where do you go? You stay there. So you go 0, 1 from Q0. Q1 goes to Q2, and Q2 rejects. So 0, 1 plus 2 uh, is going to be 0, 1, 2. OK. Sorry, I got myself confused. Uh, 0, 1, 2, and you see a B, where do you go? You're in all three states simultaneously, so you see a B. You implicitly reject from those two, and you stay in Q0 with this one. So you're going to go here. There we go. Follow along, make sure I'm not making any mistakes. Now, let's say you're in uh, a DFA has to have all transitions well defined, right? So if you're in 1, 2 simultaneously, where do you go? If you see an A, you go to 2. And if you're in 1 and 2 simultaneously, you see to B, where do you go? Trash. All right, let's say you're in 0, 2 simultaneously. I think this is where I got stuck. If you're in 0, 2 simultaneously and you see an A, where do you go? 0, 1. Zero, one. zero goes to 0, 1, and Q2 rejects. So that's going to be 0, 1 union nothing, which is going to be 0, 1. Now, what if you're in 0, 2 and you see a B? This rejects, this stays. Awesome. That is an NFA to correctly simulate the DFA. Well, we need one more part, the final states. What states are final? Uh, 2, 1, 2, 0, 2, and 0, 1, 2. Any state containing a final state. Awesome. That is a correct DFA that simulates our NFA. It correctly switches between the subsets to go to the states that we want to. There's a problem, not really a problem, because this is still a DFA, but there's something you may notice about this DFA. What is it? There's two sets that you just can never reach. Yeah, so that's technically allowed. Imagine having code, and you have a function that can never be called, that's never entered. That's technically still code. I mean, that still works, I guess, but it's not like polite. So let's just get rid of this part. That part can never be entered, right, to disconnect the component in a graph sense. Q2, Q02 also has no, no arrows incoming. 
what you can think about that means semantically is that you can, if you're in this specific NFA, there is no way, there is no combination of words that you can be in zero, into, and not in Q1 at the same time. There is no way to move non-deterministically to that exact combination. So this also can't happen. None of these states can be entered either, right? If you entered one, then great, but it's, it's not reachable. Uh, so let's rewrite this DFA after cleaning it, cleaning it up. Awesome. This is one of those examples where the DFA is the same size as the NFA. But you notice that running this algorithm really just did the closure of the DFA for us of the, on the NFA. It just filled in all the stuff for us. It just did the try-catch nonsense that I don't really care about. The NFA, great non-determinism, woohoo. But the DFA has to do all the cases. They all have to be accounted for. Um, right. So what's the point of this algorithm, right? The point is I'm not going to ask you, like, here's an NFA, convert this to a DFA, right? That's not really the point. The point is the fact that there exists a DFA at all. You can construct a DFA for an NFA. That's really the point of the, the, point of the, uh, the problem, right? So that doesn't matter. What we want to show is that the behavior then of NFAs could not be any different than that of DFAs. So every NFA has an equivalent DFA, and that's sufficient for us to prove that the set of NFAs is a subset of the set of DFAs. Take every DFA, take every NFA, convert it to a DFA. Notice that the construction, importantly, does not change the language that the NFA accepted. That's why the simulation is correct. Because the same strings are still accepted and the same strings are still rejected, that's why the, the two are, structures are identical. So every NFA has a DFA that's sufficient to us to complete the double set containment. Right? Any questions on the construction of a DFA Given an NFA, why we can simulate the determinism, uh, the non-determinism deterministically? Yeah. So, if they're equivalent, and you said that, broadly speaking, efficiency doesn't really matter in this class. What's the point of an NFA? The point of the NFA, um, I mean, it made you a better programmer. It made you like I was able to, <laughs> like, maybe there's two ways to answer this question. One is sometimes there's not points to things. Uh, that's not the nice answer, right? But in this class, it's, it's about the big picture, right? Um, Juris Hartmanis, he has this quote. It's like when he was writing all these theorems in automata, he says it's like parlor math. It was fun for a while. It's like, oh, you know, you get to sit, sit around and play checkers all day like an old man. You know, that's, that's the point. Um, that's one perspective. The other perspective is you get to be a lazy, lazy programmer. I mean, I, I think it's so cool that I get to just guess the answer and then just return that, and that's the answer. And look how little programming I had to do. You know, it was it would be great if we could write code like that. We can't, but it'd be cool if we could. You know what I mean? So, it's sort of an exponential. You can think of NFAs as like an exponential shorthand if you want for DFAs. Right? There was a DFA. I can make a. I can give you a language that the smallest DFA has 31 states, and has my NFA could only have five states. Something like this. That's another way to think of it. If you want it to be, want it to be useful. Um, the the point is in the context of this class being like a uh, a hero's journey. We defined a computational model. We defined a second computational model. We tried to generalize our computational model, and we failed. Like, uh, I tried to pretend that the NFA was stronger than the DFA, and then actually it wasn't. So we need to change how we define models of computation to build something stronger. We're trying to build what a computer is. We're trying to create an automata that perfectly captures what it means to compute something. And the NFA, unfortunately, does not do that, because it's as weak as the weak model. So, uh, more questions? That was a good question. More questions? All right. <laughs>